Father Time kicked the betters' asses over the weekend, and if you wanted to kill a kicker, I mean that strictly facetiously, figuratively, if you wanted to kill a kicker, you might be able to justify it with, uh, if you were talking about wagering on uh, kickers and uh, their efforts in the NFL on Sunday, you might be able to justify that killing by pleading self-defense. If you are betting on the games, people, and, and welcome to another edition of Barrier Bookie. I'm Jeff DeForest. Very happy to be with you here on this uh, Wheel Yourself Off the Mat Monday. I hope you guys uh, aren't licking your wounds, aren't in need of a cut man, as I was at my second marriage. Actually, the, my best man was a cut man. I had stitched Duran there just in case things went haywire. But uh, if you did get touched up over the weekend and uh, you're looking to make a comeback, or uh, even if you made major scores, and you're thinking, I'm going to send it in now because I'm playing with house money, which is uh, sometimes a mistake to consider. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for online betting. From the greatest odds and the earliest odds to in game live betting, Bet Online provides you with all the action, the ability to watch and bet on the game at the same time while they're happening. With the largest selection of odds on everything from football, NBA, NHL, to entertainment props and even political props. Will these guys get approved? I don't know. You might be able to bet on that. You can bet on just about everything at Bet Online. Head to the website today to get in on all the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering. Bet Online. The game starts here. All right. So the bookies were celebrating about uh, one minute into round two of the uh, Tyson Jake Paul fight, which was all a rage over the weekend. 50 million people tuned in on Netflix, uh, many of which walked away largely disappointed that Netflix was not up to the occasion and couldn't handle the impact of all of those eyeballs being on those screens to watch uh, the most wagered on fight in boxing history. My God, you think about all the great events there were over the course of time. The most wagered on event in boxing history, Jake Paul versus a 58-year-old Mike Tyson. And I mentioned during the week, during the buildup to this thing, where we decided that, and smart money, well, it's smart now, but smart money was going in on Jake Paul. 91% of the tickets were bet on Mike Tyson in this fight. People, sometimes when, when you're wagering, I don't mean to, uh, it's not like I'm getting on a soapbox here, but uh, once in a while, just believe what your eyes are telling you. But we talk about this when it comes to pro scouting, and you're asking yourself, what, what the fuck were these guys looking at? You could see... Then Anthony Richardson, for example, what was the most inaccurate passer that I think ever held a rock in Florida Gator history. Think about that. Danny, Danny Werfel won a Heisman Trophy with the Florida Gators because why? I don't know what extrapolations they have left from the old Steve Spurrier fun and gun in their offense. But remember uh, when Danny Werfel what was uh, winning the Heisman Trophy, and they were running this offense, everybody was wide open. If you had an aerial shot of the stadium, you had five guys out there on pass patterns, and they're all yelling, here, here, while the defensive line is counting Mississippi's. That, that's the only way this guy could win a Heisman. He didn't project out to be much of a pro. He didn't do much of that. I don't even think he's in those Dr. Pepper commercials because nobody would fucking recognize the guy. But, but you could see uh, with uh, Anthony Richardson, who uh, – I mean, a very talented athlete that he was among the most inaccurate passers we've ever seen at that level of college football. That was also demonstrating some level of success or achieving some level of success. So, so what was going to happen when he got to the pros? Was he all of a sudden uh, going to be Drew Brees? No. Was he going to be uh, of late to a Tango Bialoa? who has uh, helped uh, maybe a slight resurgence with the Miami Dolphins over the weekend with another uh, accuracy, uh, I mean, uh, performance that uh, 26 of uh, or 28 of 36 uh, in the ball game, and, and that was low percentage wise since his return from a head injury that everybody thought the concussion that uh, people were saying, oh, the guy ought to hang it up. And, and maybe in the long run, that'll turn out to be uh, pertinent advice. Uh, but uh, for right now, you're looking at a guy that's uh, spot on and, and maybe sparking a little resurgence there with the Miami Dolphins, who could they be a team to watch, even though they're only three and six? Uh, I don't know. Well, we'll see. Four and six now. Uh, the uh, Miami Dolphins through uh, ten ball games. Uh, all right, uh, but yeah, getting back to the fight. I mean, you have to believe what you see. Now, now we were duped into it. We talked about the parallel uh, with the Ali Holmes fight, one of my biggest scores I ever made in my life, or, or largest wager certainly at that time that I had made in my life. What was on uh, Larry Holmes when he fought Muhammad Ali in Las Vegas? And the day before the fight, uh, all of these newspapers around the country are circulating a picture on page one, not even the sports section, page one, Ali is back. 
He had taken this thyroid medication that somehow, I, I guess it was a forerunner to Ozempic or something, because the guy went from uh, looking uh, like a, a body that was no better than Chuck Wepner's when he fought him, uh, just uh, bloated and uh, fat hanging over his trunks. <laughs> and you're thinking, this guy should not be in the ring anymore, which we knew because uh, we had seen the levels uh, of uh, Parkinson's already beginning to uh, the onset was more than there with Ali while he was still uh, contesting uh, bouts in the ring. And, and this Holmes fight was as ill-advised as any. I got to know the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, uh, pretty closely uh, years later. And, and uh, he went to his grave saying, I was screaming at him not to do it. Don't do it. You're finished. Washed up. And, and the entire fight was spent uh, screaming at the referee, Carlos Padilla. Stop it, ref. It's a killing. Now, because of this picture that was circulating in all of the newspapers around the country when newspapers were still relevant and everybody got one, or at least walked by a newsstand somewhere where you could see, wow, look at Ali. He looks great. And the same thing happened here with Mike Tyson. As uh, you saw the clips, Netflix did a good job of pushing this. And you saw the clips of him beating the shit out of the guy that was wearing the, uh, the mitts and uh, had the protection on. And uh, you're, you're asking yourself, hey, is this the Mike Tyson of old? But uh, no, all you had to do was realize that this was the old Mike Tyson. That boxing is, uh, I mean, it, it is as physically taxing as any sport that you could possibly get involved in. And you're not going to last long. I mean, two minutes uh, rounds, uh, notwithstanding two minutes uh, of boxing when, when you're 58 years old, no matter what kind of cardio shape you're in or try to get in leading up to it. Boxing's a great workout. We all know that. So you can credit the great Michael Silk Elijah Day with convincing people that uh, they could actually get in tremendous shape by going through boxing regimens uh, in terms of uh, physical training. And, and sure enough, it became very, very popular. But anybody that's done it realizes that when you actually step in there and try to box for three minutes, it's exhausting. I mean, uh, it, it is going to be a, a, as physically tough as, as anything that you could ever do as an athlete. And this just wasn't going to work for Mike Tyson. So it didn't. Turned out to be a, a massive flop. Uh, he, he froze in there and was uh, just like this for the last six rounds. Picks up $20 million. And, and you're asking yourself, who the fuck was compelled to bet on this to drive the overall purse, uh, I mean, overall take of the bookmakers up uh, to, to record levels? J just absolutely insane. Sport has become circus uh, to a large extent. And Jake Paul, I don't know that he proved anything, except that he at least was willing to uh, test the question of, uh, A, could Mike Tyson do anything or uh, represent any reasonable facsimile of what he was in the past? Because everybody's saying the same thing. They're spewing the same cliches. Well, the last thing you lose is your power. Yeah, but the first thing you lose is your legs, which uh, generates his power. And uh, when... He did land a blow in the first round, uh, Mike Tyson, and Paul was able to just shake it off and stick his tongue out at the guy. You were thinking, okay, this one's pretty much over, and uh, you can run to the window and cash your ticket on Jake Paul. So smart money coming in late on Jake Paul. Most of the bets were on Mike Tyson. The bookies, they were, uh, you know, I mean, watching the fight on Netflix. If their, their screen didn't freeze up, they're all uh, sitting around going, hey, Lou, you see this? He's out of gas already. Uh, they, they had a heavy stake in having Jake Paul uh, win that fight with, with the action that they took, weren't able to lay it all off. And uh, they were going to take a beating worse than Tyson did, which, uh, and, and Jake Paul uh, could have done almost anything to him uh, at that point. Uh, uh, if uh, you had been in the ring yourself with Mike Tyson, you might have been able to knock him out. So he carries him the distance, and that comes off, as you might have expected, uh, maybe a little bit preordained. At plus 140. So so that was a way to make a little score on the fight. But, uh, yeah, father time undefeated. It, it was uh, pure, unadulterated ugliness from the start. Uh, the Netflix production oh, largely panned. I mean, uh, it was an interesting enterprise. I don't know if they anticipated the volume of people that were going to watch this. They, they had to think that it was going to be some kind of mind-blowing number. I believe uh, they had uh, estimated 50 million people tuned into this. And, of course, they, they had, I mean, they sold uh, almost 70,000 seats at, at Jerry World. Incredible. But Netflix ill-prepared for this. Uh, they, they kept uh, having their system crash, uh, and uh, you were getting that dreaded circle as uh, you, you thought uh, you were going to have the thing come right back, but it didn't. A lot of people were sort of shut out and got aggravated with that. And the production, from a technical standpoint itself, well, was an outright disaster. 
It started uh, early, too, because uh, you had uh, Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield very appropriately up there uh, on the pre-fight uh, hyperbole that they were spewing out uh, in uh, just massive volume, including having uh, Showtime's former uh, play-by-play guy, Mauro Ranallo, who was uh, just screaming metaphoric shit the entire time. <laughs> and you're asking, hey, hey, Mauro. Could you tone it down a little bit? The other guys are talking while he's uh, screaming his stuff because he hadn't finished uh, with the hyperbole. It was very annoying uh, the way that they uh, actually transmitted this thing and uh, and had the crew uh, just screaming this hype uh, the entire time because it certainly was deflating to see what actually took place. But but the women's bout uh, turned out to be a spectacular if you got to see it. And then, of course, uh, there was the traditional boxing uh, robbery that, that uh, transpired as – you had the scorecards were all way out of whack with what everybody else thought they saw in the fight. Uh, this Amanda Serrano getting robbed a uh, second time in her bout with uh, Katie Taylor. And uh, that that stole the show. Uh, the bad decision uh, notwithstanding, uh, that, that stole the show. And uh, might have been the lone salvation if you were a boxing fan for watching. And uh, think about that. I mentioned Ferdy Pacheco. I used to I had the pleasure of calling some fights with him uh, many, many years ago when I first started doing TV boxing. And uh, he would literally walk out. There was the mandatory woman's bout that was uh, ascribed to, to and assigned to every card because of Christy Martin had popularized the idea that women uh, could be pro boxers, which uh, and, and she distinguished herself well enough to let you uh, think that, yes, OK, that could happen. That the problem was there was never any depth in terms of the various weight divisions. So you would get one uh, woman who could really box a little bit. And, and then uh, the opposition was always. I mean, it was beyond early Canelo Alvarez, where they were digging up bodies from German graveyards. So uh, to see this, uh, it was spectacular. The the two uh, ladies uh, really, I mean, uh, got it on in Mills Lane type fashion, and uh, that 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 was and they're cut and they're bleeding and the ref, uh, you know, is involved here. Is a lot of headbutting was going on, but. Uh, that gave people at least, uh, and maybe that was the fortunate thing. People are always trying to judge. Well, was this a black eye for boxing? But um, at, at least that gave uh, people that were maybe uninitiated as diehard boxing fans who just tuned in for the sensationalism and the circus of it. What with Jake Paul having his uh, eight zillion followers, and of course Mike Tyson, one of the most popular guys in the aftermath of his career, uh, has as good a following, as solid a following as uh, anybody that that ever boxed because. They remember the old Iron Mike who was knocking out those 20 stiffs on his way to a 20 and 0 record. And uh, it did acquit himself extremely well in the ring, although unfortunately for him, couldn't acquit himself in court and, and probably was never the same uh, after he uh, did that three year stint in prison. But I um, hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, if you want to kill a kicker, and I, I don't recommend this, I mean, I, it's a figure of speech, but uh, you had every reason to. What a disaster it was uh, in the National Football League if uh, you had certain teams and, and you were counting on uh, the place kicker to get you home to cover a point spread. Uh, it happened. And it's all the teams that involved with a B, right? Uh, the Bears, Baltimore, Bengals, the Browns even uh, got involved with a kicker with an horrendous performance uh, that uh, they eventually lost by a significant margin to New Orleans. But uh, when the game was sort of uh, on the line, if you were stuck with the Browns, which I was, in a personal bookmaking venture that I had with a friend of mine, uh, he, he just uh, assigns me the team that he doesn't want. And uh, in this case, I, I have the Browns, which uh, you're already chalking that up as a loss. They're in the damn game uh, against the New Orleans Saints. They have a kicker uh, sets up for like a 20-yard chip shot field goal. He misses it. They get a ridiculous holding penalty against the defense. Who is the defense holding on the offensive line on a place kick try, a field goal try? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the call uh, stands, and uh, now it's a uh, first and goal from, from an even shorter range, uh, like the three-yard line. Uh, the Browns fail to punch the ball in the end zone, so they go for another field goal, and they miss that. <laughs> if you wanted to kill a kicker, I mean, you're perfectly entitled to, uh, on that one. Uh, the Bengals, Evan McPherson, he's been struggling all year. You're in the fourth quarter of this game against the Chargers. You were hopelessly out of it. You probably already said, ah, fuck this. I'm going to turn this off and go to sleep. But uh, if you were back in the Bengals in that ball game, they're, they're, they're down 21-6, and they bounce back and uh, rally for 21 unanswered points. They tie the ball game at 27. And uh, before you know it, uh, they, they have two field goal chances in the fourth quarter. McPherson misses them both. And uh, costly for sure because uh, they end up going down by – by seven points to the Chargers, who who were 
I mean, you, you would have lost to the sprint anyway if they gave up that touchdown, but who knows? It's impossible to judge a subsequent series of events if the scoreboard dynamic was different. So uh, McPherson, if you wanted to kill a kicker, the Bengals kicker uh, would qualify also. Then you have, I mean, what happened to Justin Tucker? This guy sings opera like he was Pavarotti. And to dream the American dream. I mean, what the fuck happened to this guy? He used to be an automatic from the time that you would see him toying around there with the little net. He didn't even bother to warm up like a lot of kickers do. He'd even take a couple of fake kicks. Hey, just uh, piss around there with the little net on the sideline. He'd walk out there on the field, the epitome of uh, confidence. And, and whatever distance it was, it, it could be 25 yards, it could be 65 yards. You thought, wow, this Justin Tucker uh, is either going to make this as an automatic or at least have a shot no matter what the range, 70 yards. Okay, Tucker, send him out there. I got a little bit of hope. I'm going to call in uh, during the game on, on uh, bet online and, and, and bet that he makes this fucking thing at like 50 to 1. Um, yeah, reliable as hell. I mean, the most accurate kicker, I believe, I, I think he came into the season as the most accurate kicker in NFL history. If he isn't number one, he's right there knocking on the door. So, so far this year, he's 16 of 22, including a couple of misses in the game against the Pittsburgh Steelers that ultimately not only cost the, the Ravens the ball game, uh, but uh, cost you any chance you had uh, of beating the point spread as uh, the uh, Ravens uh, were favored in this ball game, and the Steelers are proven to be pretty tough hombres I don't know. Can you give them championship consideration? Uh, since they've had Russell Wilson in there, they have a little bit of an offensive spark. But uh, can we possibly consider the Pittsburgh Steelers as championship material? I, I, I'm struggling to do that. But uh, nonetheless, uh, a, a good victory for them. And every time you start to embrace the Ravens as surefire uh, cinches to go to the Super Bowl, uh, they, they blow a gasket and end up looking uh, pretty ordinary. And then, of course, the Bears, uh, you had uh, Cairo Santos trots out there. This is the second week in a row. We've seen this in the NFL, people. Uh, what a disaster. Second week in a row where, where a team is lined up for a game-winning field goal in a spot where they're about to score an impressive upset. Uh, a week ago, it was the uh, Denver Broncos about to take out the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Broncos turned out to be a pretty decent team this year and, and maybe have found something there with, with uh, Bo Nix. They're playing very well, and, and they had an impressive victory yesterday over the Falcons. But they, they trot out their uh, field goal kicker, and uh, he uh, he whiffs. He gets the kick blocked. The same thing happens with the Bears. They position themselves perfectly to win a ball game against the Green Bay Packers yesterday. Trot out uh, Cairo Santos, and uh, right in the middle of the line, he gets the field goal blocked. And uh, sure enough, what, what looked like a Bears victory. This Eberfluss, I mean, as he saw his contract going in the shredder yesterday, has to be lamenting uh, those two losses, uh, the one with the Hail Mary against the Commanders, and then this, uh, I mean, just an outright piece of shit. Uh, I mean, he's in a perfect position to win the game, uh, ends up getting a field goal block. So if you had the Bears on the money line, that, that was an unmerciful beat. Four, four different teams, all uh, involving beats. Bears, uh, Baltimore, Bengals, Browns. If you wanted to kill a kicker, uh, you had every, every right to at least consider it figuratively after yesterday's action in the uh, National Football League. Uh, we uh, had an okay week. Uh, I wouldn't say that we did anything sensational. We, we eked out a winning week last week with our handicappers. The professor is having a really tough year uh, so far this year. I know you catch him on Fridays. I, I, I've listened to him for over 20 years, handicapping college basketball and football. Off to a good start in college basketball, although he buried us with a game on Friday night. And uh, college football, he, he's been winning these Friday night games. He, he gets off to a good start there with Washington, which uh, was in a game we had some agreement on. Troy West was also on the Washington bandwagon. Uh, they come through with a win for us, and uh, they were playing the UCLA. So so we had a couple of guys get home on that. But then uh, the professor, after going up 10 nothing. Uh, with Tennessee, Georgia, Georgia comes roaring back, ties the game in halftime, dominates the second half, gets themselves back in the picture for the national championship, or at least to be part of the 12 in the playoff. And so uh, we take one on the chin there, and then the professor also went down with LSU. Uh, uh, Troy West, who uh, has been a consistent 2-1, and one, uh, he went 3-0 and oh one week. He's had one losing week, and 2-1 and one every other week we've been doing the show here for uh, the entirety of the football season. So you're winning with this guy. Had Washington, also had Arizona, lost with San Jose State. They were kind of in that ball game briefly against Boise State and uh, ended up uh, getting uh, trounced. So uh, San Jose State getting 14 and a half was not enough <laughs> to uh, salvage a victory there. Uh, Mike Jones uh, had a good week, uh, two and one. 
And uh, he ended up at Detroit. I had a friend that uh, put a ticket up from the South Point. And our good friend Sheldon G., we reference him from time to time. He got out a winning tip horse here on Barrier Bookie. And uh, he uh, he put up a ticket, 50, 55000 to win 50000 on Detroit yesterday, laying uh, 13 and a half. he got it at, which was a bargain because Jacksonville sucks. So uh, And Detroit does like to run up the score. They're, they're not afraid. They're kicking field goals late in the game when they're completely unnecessary. So uh, he hits with Detroit. Uh, loses on the Green Bay Chicago game. He liked Green Bay in that one. They were laying five and a half, and uh, they ended up uh, winning by one. And, and then uh, he liked the Bills over the Kansas City Chiefs, who are no longer undefeated. So he goes off at two and one. And we had uh, Scotty M at uh, two and two on the week. Uh, and all of these guys will be joining us again uh, this week. Scotty M tomorrow. But uh, he loses, gets a little cute there, goes for the over in the Coastal Carolina Marshall game, a game that you normally wouldn't give any consideration to on any level, side and or over, under, prop bets, whatever. Uh, he goes for it, says it's going to be a shootout. Uh, the game was well under. Uh, but he does uh, win also with Tulane over Navy. That was a shutout of Blitzkrieg. And uh, the Dolphins, which uh, looked like an easy victory over the Raiders and uh, for all intents and purposes, it was. Uh, we were also in on that Dolphin game. Figured it was a 10-point game at the very least, and uh, they, they tallied late. and They had a rally a little bit late in the fourth quarter to uh, cover the point spread in the ball game. although it did look like, for the most part, that they were going to come out with the victory. And uh, he loses with Kansas City. Uh, another adage goes up in smoke here, a common cliche, which is uh, never, never go against Patrick Mahomes as an underdog. I, I think he was something to the tune of 11-1. and one against the spread uh, as an underdog whenever the Chiefs uh, are, are the dog in the ball game, And they were against the Buffalo Bills, but uh, this time it didn't work. It came up and the percentages uh, all of a sudden uh, began to level off just a little bit. It's an unfortunate time if you were bought into that cliche. And uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, goes down in flames as the Kansas City Chiefs are no longer among the ranks of the unbeaten. All right, uh, should be a lot of fun this week. We have a Monday night game to uh, take a look at. Houston and the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, that's kind of a mystery line for me. Houston and the Dallas Cowboys. As uh, it, The Cowboys are only getting seven points at home. They haven't won a home game all season long, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, they have uh, a, any number of lame backup quarterbacks uh, that are going to be performing for them. So you, you can't figure that they're going to put a lot of points on the board. And the Houston Texans, as uh, much of a Cinderella story as they were last year, and, and still have shown signs of life, this season, at the same time, have been finding ways to lose games as well. So are they seven points better than the Dallas Cowboys going on the road tonight, Monday night football? Uh, you would have to, at first glance, think yes. But uh, it's surprising to me that that uh, lion isn't a little bit fatter uh, in favor of the Houston Texans because uh, you would be inclined to believe that the Dallas Cowboys are absolutely dead in the water. And you could probably look at one man and blame him for that, and that would be one Jerry Jones. Give it up, Jerry! If you're a Cowboy fan, have you had enough of Jerry Jones as a general manager of this team? It's been 25 years, fucking Jerry. Still uh, always thinking about uh, the uh, picture that comes up where uh, they have uh, a, a current Dallas Cowboys cheerleader looking absolutely sensational, which uh, they were on hand for the... Uh, Paul Tyson fight, Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders performing before and uh, gave a, a very good account of themselves. And, and they'll have uh, like the most spectacular of the modern day version of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And they say, here are the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders today. And here they are the last time the Cowboys won a Super Bowl. And you got some old bag lady uh, with a shopping cart in front of her in a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader uh, outfit, not to uh, demean or impugn uh, the uh, concern that we should have for, for uh, homeless people. But uh, nonetheless, it's a sad depiction of how Father Time has not been well or not served well the Dallas Cowboys. As was the case with Mike Tyson. You can't beat Father Time, people. Just believe sometimes what your eyeballs are telling you. And then as you put a 58-year-old guy in a boxing ring and ask him to go with anybody that even has the slightest semblance of boxing ability for a two-minute round even, and the chances are, as Johnny Mathis would say, chances are that he's going to be finished by round number two, which was essentially the case there in the uh, Tyson-Jake uh, Paul fight. What does Jake Paul do next? Tyson actually implied that he would fight again. Nobody would watch that, would they? Unless, as I suggested last week, that he took on Ruth Roper and she had a purse full of his cash that she had taken from him when he was married to Robin Gibbons and, and was threatening to hit him in the head with that. that. That might be 
as an entertainment uh, function. That would be, be pretty uh, pretty good to watch. But uh, other than that, I, I don't know that anybody would want to see him again. And uh, now all of these real boxers are uh, looking at the money that Tyson made for standing there and, and uh, looking like the heavy bag, like he was on a chain attached to the ceiling. And uh, all of these real guys like uh, Better Beev and Canelo are, are talking about, hey, Jake, I'm next. Quit ducking me because uh, they, they want that fat payday. People would probably, uh, at that point, if anybody was betting on Jake Paul, they would have had to be uh, flat out out of their mind. All right, a lot of fun being with you. Uh, the uh, game tonight, I don't know. I, I can't imagine that the Cowboys are going to be uh, in a close contest here. So I'd be inclined to, uh, and, and I don't want to go out on a limb with this one and say, uh, yeah, I, I love the Texans. But uh, as I said, I, I was positioned into uh, having an interest in the Dallas Cowboys tonight by my friend who's a bet side book. Uh, he picks all the games. I just book them. And uh, it's been very profitable for me over the years. Uh, this is all on the up and up. Uh, it's, a, it's a friendly thing. Not a ton of money involved, but uh, there's the competitive desire to win. That, that drives most people. I don't care if it's five bucks or 50,000. You, you just want to win. You want to know, you want the validation to know that you were right. Now, in this case, I'm not making uh, any kind of conjecture as to which side should win. I just got stuck with the Cowboys. For some reason, as bad of a handicapper as this guy is, I, I can't see them beating the Houston Texans. Uh, did the Texans cover seven? Uh, I'd be inclined to say yes to that. So um, I'm going to make that a very, very vague choice. In a ball game tonight. Too much chalk, huh? Too much chalk. Rough week uh, for a lot of people. I was uh, looking at a handicapper in a New York Post, and uh, he, he was two and twelve, or he is two and twelve, I think, going into uh, tonight's ball game. Two and twelve, picking NFL games with, with supposed expertise. So it's not easy, people. Tread lightly. All right, uh, we will join you tomorrow. Scotty M will be with us, and uh, we'll uh, feature uh, all of our handicappers throughout the week. So we'll uh, try and get some insight on a lot of different things this week on Barrier Your Bookie for the people that bet online and uh, also Greenlight Ventures, nofilter.net. I'm Jeff DeForest. Thanks for tuning in to uh, today's edition of Peel Yourself Off the Mat edition of Barry Your Bookie.